Hi, I'm Dr. Chad Larson. Thanks for joining me in another episode of Keep It Real. So lately I've been treating a lot of my patients for post-holiday syndrome. And post-holiday syndrome comes about when, you know, when we overindulge during the holidays on um, too much sugar, too much refined grain flour type products, breads, pastas, crackers, chips, cookies, pastries, that kind of stuff too much alcohol, and more often than not, sleep deprivation. So that's just a perfect storm of, you know, insults to the system to uh, cause people to reflare in their symptoms and um, kind of give them an overall sense of unwellness. So then oftentimes people get frustrated and they say, oh man, I messed it up. It's too hard to get back on the program. But it's not, it's, it's actually really easy. You're just one meal away from being right back into making better health decisions. One meal away. So the next meal that you have, just make good healthy food choices and you're right back on the program. So go easy on yourself. Um, be happy that you enjoyed the holidays. Even if there are some poor health decisions, it's no big deal. Just uh, you're one meal away from being back on a better health plan. So I just want to start out with that message, but mostly today I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, autoimmunity. So with a background in orthopedics and sports medicine, I was, I was a little reluctant into the category of autoimmunity, but it just kept showing up in my office. So I needed to get better and better educated on autoimmunity and what autoimmunity is, what kind of people it affects, and how to treat it. And so um, that started probably about seven years ago, seven or eight years ago, I really started to uh, dive into the literature in autoimmunity and get a much better understanding of, of how a person develops autoimmunity what are the risk factors for, de for developing autoimmunity? And so I just wanna mention a few things about that today. Most rheumatologists, which are uh, specialists, medical specialists uh, that treat people with autoimmune conditions, the main focus with most uh, rheumatologists is uh, prescription medications and what kind of medications are best for what conditions. And if that medication doesn't work, what's the next medication? that would be most appropriate. And medications absolutely have a place in autoimmunity. And, um, and there's certain cases where um, that's the best choice is a medication. But I just wanna fill in some of the details, maybe some more um, broad scope information about a more uh, whole body way of evaluating autoimmunity. Oftentimes what we want to do is just get stuck on their symptoms and it's tempting to just want to suppress their symptoms because we don't like to see our patients uncomfortable and many autoimmune conditions there's pain and other types of dysfunction of the uh, of the body and the temptation is to prescribe a medication that just suppresses that particular symptom. And, some, and again, in some cases, that's absolutely indicated and necessary. But uh, while we're considering the medications and ways that we can start to decrease medications, or maybe even when uh, certain medications are not really indicated, but a person is suffering from an autoimmune condition, let's start to consider what really are the risk factors for autoimmunity. And so, um, there was an interesting uh, research paper that was published uh, a few years ago, and the researchers really wanted to um, challenge the current paradigm of autoimmunity. Because the current parado paradigm really goes like this. Um, it goes genetics, in other words, autoimmunity is a genetically determined condition, and then you just have to have an environmental trigger and it triggers those genes to then uh, lead to that particular autoimmune condition. Remember, autoimmune conditions are different things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, 
multiple sclerosis. Um, there's, depending on what tissues in the body uh, the person is manifesting symptoms in, or what part of the body the immune system is attacking, is how we determine what kind of autoimmune condition a person has. So in other words, if it's in the joints, that's more of a rheumatoid arthritis. Um, if it's in the connective tissue, that could be lupus, or it could be scleroderma, that kind of thing. So there's lots of different autoimmune conditions out there, and there's uh, specific clinical ways to diagnose those conditions. But what we really want to be concerned about and interested in with autoimmunity is what are the triggers? What are the, the predisposing factors to a person who has autoimmunity? And what this um, paper um, sought to evaluate was, is there more to the current paradigm of autoimmunity? The current paradigm me meaning um, genetics and environmental factor. You first have to have a genetic predisposition, and if you're exposed to a certain environmental insult, that'll influence your genes to then manifest that autoimmune condition. But what they figured out in this study was that there's a third leg to that three-legged stool, and the third leg is intestinal permeability. So not, not only is genetics a consideration, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, and not only is environmental triggers a consideration, but intestinal permeability, or the barrier system in your gut that keeps things from getting into your circulation. If there's compromise to that intestinal barrier, that also is a considerable risk factor. It's a key gateway to autoimmunity. So let's talk about genetics for a moment, because you know, genetics is kind of the blueprint of our life, but there's multiple factors. In fact, there's a whole subcategory of medicine called epigenetics. There's lots of factors that really determine our genetic uh, um, expression. And so what we've learned is that genetics only accounts for about one-third of the risk factors for developing autoimmunity. And this is information that I am quoting directly from a study done by the National Institutes of Health. They have uh, an autoimmune advisory committee that puts out this information and guidelines based on uh, evaluation of a whole host of research. And then they come up with these guidelines and they put that into a, a published paper that we can read and kind of check out the latest information. And that's what the latest information says, is that genetics only contributes about one-third of a person's risk for developing autoimmunity. So one-third is just over 30%. So what that leaves is almost 70% of other risk factors. And so what are those other risk factors? Those other risk factors are environmental triggers, and intestinal permeability. Environmental fig, uh, triggers is a, is a pretty big category. Let's talk about one specific autoimmune condition just so you know what we mean by triggers, environmental triggers, and that's celiac disease. Celiac disease is an autoimmune condition of the small intestine. And we know the specific trigger for celiac disease is gluten. Gluten is a, is a protein found in wheat and rye and barley and other grains that if a person with celiac disease takes gluten out of their diet, their autoimmune condition goes into remission. But with other autoimmune conditions, it's not quite as black and white as to what the, the trigger is for their autoimmune condition. But this is the challenge and the fascinating part of, uh, of treating somebody with an autoimmune condition is we have to try and identify their trigger or triggers that is causing that type of immune dysregulation. And now, also knowing that other third leg to the three-legged stool, which is intestinal permeability. So it's a really key therapeutic opportunity. So if you have an autoimmune condition, or you have a loved one who has an autoimmune condition, those are the three factors that you really want to consider. Genetics, which maybe you can't really do anything about, and it only contributes um, about a third 
but also you want to consider the other two pieces, which is environmental triggers, and I'll break that down in just a moment, and then intestinal permeability. And all this stuff can be tested. That's what's cool about it. So under environmental triggers, triggers, environmental triggers, there's really uh, three main categories of environmental triggers. So there's a lot of them, but there's three main categories. And the three main categories are dietary proteins. Dietary proteins, think of like gluten in wheat or um, other foods that might fall into this category of dietary proteins, maybe certain dairy proteins, um, certain egg proteins have been found, and other foods have been found to potentially trigger autoimmunity in certain susceptible individuals. So that's one category of environmental triggers is, um, is dietary proteins. Another key category are pathogens. There's lots of pathogens that um, in the research have been linked to a whole, uh, whole host of different autoimmune conditions. And they can be bacteria, they can be viruses, there can be molds, lots of different pathogens that we have to kind of sift through to figure out what might be a trigger for um, our patient's um, autoimmunity. But that's one really key trigger, environmental trigger, is pathogens. And the third one is chemicals. The third category in the environmental trigger kind of concept is uh, chemicals. So we have dietary proteins, we have pathogens, and we have chemicals. And under chemicals, it could be heavy metals, like mercury, lead, that kind of thing. Um, there could be other chemicals like BPA, bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is everywhere. And it's a really key uh, potential environmental trigger that can lead to autoimmunity. There's some really current research going on uh, really helping us to understand how BPA affects our systems. BPA is a completely synthetic uh, chemical that does not exist in nature, but it's all over the place now. It's, a, it's kind of a plasticizer agent. It's in all of your plastic bottles. That's why now you'll see some bottles that say BPA free. And that's what they're talking about is they've understood this connection to um, its effect on health and they've eliminated it from their product. Um, and so they'll put on you know, the bottle or whatever the product is BPA free, which is nice, but who knows what they're replacing it with. Is the replacement for the BPA any healthier than BPA? And I think further research will have to uh, inform us of that. But anyhow, BPA is a well understood issue. BPA also lines the linings inside of cans, like canned foods. It's also a, um, it's also a, a key um, component of receipts, of all things. So when somebody hands you a receipt after you visit you know, a merchant and uh, they give you a receipt, those receipts are loaded with BPA. And so guess what else has a lot of BPA on it because of the receipts? What most people do is they take their receipt and they tuck it in their wallet right next to their cash. So lots of uh, paper dollars also now are contaminated with BPA. So it's hard to get away from it. But what we understand is that BPA could be one of these chemical triggers that lead to autoimmunity in certain susceptible individuals. And uh, there's some recent research that I read recently um, about BPA's connection to multiple sclerosis. Um, and I think we're gonna find out more and more uh, autoimmune conditions that BPA is going to be associated with because it's a pretty nasty chemical and just as kind of a side note since we're on the topic of bpa it's also been implicated in um, influencing hormones it's what we sometimes call a um, endocrine disruptor endocrine disruptor affects our hormone metabolism so that's even kind of a side of uh, its effects associated with autoimmunity so those are the three categories of triggers which are dietary proteins, uh, pathogens, and chemicals. So if you have an autoimmune condition, I would really uh, suggest that you speak to your doctor about evaluating you for um, some of these environmental triggers. And I would absolutely strongly suggest that you have them evaluate for, for intestinal permeability. Sometimes we call that leaky gut, which is not an official term, but um, sometimes that's the way we describe it to a patient, that if you have leaky gut, then things are allowed to get through your gut barrier that are not supposed to. And so that's intestinal permeability or leaky gut. 
And then, uh, of course, the genetic factor, which only constitutes, you know, a third of your potential risk for autoimmunity. So, so that's autoimmunity in a nutshell. We can talk, you know, for an entire week just about autoimmunity, but it's a, uh, it's a fairly common and I think increasingly common uh, condition. Um, you certainly do not have to have a genetic or family history to develop an autoimmune condition. Um, so um, those are a few little tidbits about autoimmunity and um, hopefully you learned something and I hope you, uh, you consider those factors if you in fact have autoimmunity or if uh, when your loved ones do. So hope that was helpful. We'll talk to you next time. Keep it real.